oral arguments. Click on America and the Courts. Now a House committee looks at cancer treatment and participation in clinical trials. We'll hear from officials with the National Cancer Institute and the Food and Drug Administration. This is two hours. We'll come to order. I want to welcome everybody to today's oversight hearing on cancer clinical trials. This hearing will examine the status of efforts to bring innovative cancer treatments to patients and discuss how to change the face of cancer into a less terminal and more treatable disease. The two panels of witnesses today will present testimony on the various factors contributing to low accrual of adult patients in cancer clinical trials and what efforts are being taken to obtain reasonable participation levels to better provide more treatment options for cancer patients. Cancer is the second leading cause of death in the United States, taking the lives of over half a million Americans each year of more than 1,500 people each day. Roughly 1.3 million new cancer cases are diagnosed in this country each year. These statistics are sobering. All of us here today know a relative or friend who has been diagnosed with some type of cancer. Anyone who has been affected by cancer understands the needs for more and better treatment options for patients. And in order for new drugs and therapies to be approved by the Food and Drug Administration, several cancer clinical trials must be conducted. Clinical trials are essential for determining safe, and effective therapies in modern medicine. Early detection of cancer and the application of new treatments developed through clinical research are responsible for significant improvements in cancer survival rates. Clinical trials are designed to answer scientific questions, which translate into better and less toxic therapies for patients. Trials allow doctors and researchers to gain information about the benefits, the side effects, possible applications and doses of new and existing drugs. In order for scientists and oncologists to make accurate conclusions about an experimental new drug's effect, clinical trials require the participation of numerous cancer patients. Further, research has shown that trial participants nearly always receive equivalent or better care than those receiving standard treatments, despite the experimental nature of these investigational treatments. Clinical trials can offer patients advanced treatments that would be otherwise unattainable. Thousands of people are helped each year by joining cancer clinical trials, and millions of people have ultimately benefited from others' participation in trials. So we pose the question to our panel of witnesses today, why do only 3 percent of adults nationwide enroll in clinical trials when up to 20 percent are eligible? And what efforts are being taken to resolve the barriers to better clinical trials and adequate adult enrollment? We want to examine the different scientific, logistical, and financial realities that interact to impede reasonable participation in adult trials. The lack of patient and physician education about clinical trials, problems traveling uh, to the trial sites, strict eligibility criteria, third-party payer reimbursement policies prevent a large number of patients from participating. As a result of these contributing factors, a vast majority of cancer patients fail to even consider clinical trials when reviewing their treatment options. We will hear today from the cancer community uh, the urgency to reverse this situation and resolve the barriers uh, to adequate adult enrollment in clinical trials. Clinical trials are essential for improving outcomes in cancer patients. By improving participation levels and creating more trials to new test therapies, we can transform cancer into a more treatable and less fatal disease. The equation is simple. Clinical research leads to the discovery of new and better therapies for cancer patients, and helping them live longer will improve their quality of life. I know all of our witnesses this morning will agree that we need to boost participation in clinical trials. Along with uh, improving accrual rates, we may need to consider improving other ways our health community approaches cancer. Clinical trials are just a single component of the cancer spectrum. I understand the complexity of the disease and the intricacies surrounding the discovery, development, uh, and delivery of treatments. I look forward to a constructive dialogue on this topic. The committee welcomes our witnesses uh, for this important testimony today. I would now yield to my colleague, Henry Waxman, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am pleased to participate in this uh, hearing on how to accelerate progress against cancer. Uh, this is a topic that I have worked on for many years. When I was the chair of the Health Subcommittee of Energy and Commerce Committee, I was responsible for legislation reauthorizing the National Cancer Institute. We worked with experts inside and outside of the government to improve rehabilitation services, expand research on reproductive cancers, and strengthen education and grant-making decisions.
It has also been my priority to make sure that all Americans have access to benefits of medical progress against cancer. And I'm particularly proud of legislation that expanded access to, to screening for breast and cervical cancer and of legislation that provided Medicaid coverage for those who are found on screening to have these tumors. Today's hearing highlights how much more needs to be done. Over the last several decades, while rates of heart disease have dropped dramatically, rates of cancer have largely remained stable. Despite progress against a few specific tumors, cancer will kill an estimated 500,000 Americans in 2004. Well, the simplest and quickest way to make a dramatic reduction in cancer in the United States is to prevent it. Every member of Congress knows that the number one preventable cause of cancer in the United States is the cigarette. Last year, a committee advising the Department of Health and Human Services recommended a simple, evidence-based plan to help 5 million people quit smoking and save 3 million lives. The plan was endorsed by former Surgeons General Dr. Julius Richmond, Dr. David Satcher, and Dr. C. Everett Koop. Unfortunately, the Bush administration has shelved this report, and this Congress has not held a single hearing to discuss or review its recommendations. This week, New York City announced that smoking rates have dropped 11 percent in just one year as a result of Mayor Bloomberg's aggressive anti-tobacco policies, saving an estimated 30,000 lives. The response to this news should be obvious. The President and congressional leaders should pursue how to replicate these achievements across the country. But don't hold your breath. The National Republican Party is so closely aligned with the tobacco industry that the only hearings we have had on tobacco in the House recently have highlighted the alleged health benefits of smokeless tobacco. Unbelievable as that is, that's the only hearing that's been held on the topic of tobacco. Today's hearing will focus on the challenges facing clinical research in cancer. Let me mention two issues at the outset. First, to find cures for cancer, we, we must adequately support a clinical research infrastructure that can prove that cures work. And I'm very concerned that Dr. Robert Comas, a senior oncologist who represents the Cooperative Group Program, will testify today that current finding stifles innovation, destabilizes key functions such as our tissue banks, data management, and infor informatics platforms, and acts as a disincentive to both academic and community physician participation in research. And that's because of these current funding levels. Now that reductions in reimbursement for oncologists mandated by Congress are due to take effect, it's, it is critical that NCI and Congress assure adequate funding for research. Second, to provide access to clinical trials, it is important that government resources sources such as www.clinicaltrials.gov work well. This is a website created by the Congress in 1997 that is supposed to contain information for patients about ongoing trials for serious and life-threatening diseases such as cancer. A 2003 study by the FDA staff found that fewer than half of the cancer studies that are legally required to be listed on this website were actually listed by the companies. This lack of participation by the drug industry is a, in an important resource for patients is inexcusable. And I'm disappointed that the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers Association, Pharma, which was invited to testify, has been unable to send a witness to this hearing. Today we'll hear from leading health officials at the National Cancer Institute and the Food and Drug Administration, from senior cancer researchers, and from a leading representative of cancer patients. And I thank these distinguished witnesses for coming today. I look forward to uh, their testimony. Uh, thank you very much. Any other uh, members wish to make statements? If not, any statements can be put in the record. Mr. Murphy? Sure. Gentlemen's right. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding this uh, here on cancer screening trials. And we all know few issues have 
as negative of an impact upon so many as, as cancer. Uh, though all of us have not been diagnosed, we certainly all hold the roots of this disease and we all know someone close to us who is, has or uh, has had some impact of cancer. While modern medicine has brought us a long way towards winning this battle, anyone who has a parent or a child or a friend diagnosed with cancer knows all too well we have not come anywhere near far enough. Increased participation in cancer clinical trials would significantly increase the discovery of newer cancer treatments with the ability to keep cancer patients feeling better while undergoing treatment, add years to their lives, and of course even cure them of the disease altogether. However, we will never have enough adult volunteers if patients continue to be misinformed or not encouraged to participate. It certainly saddens me to read the survey cited that National Cancer Institute revealed that 85 percent of cancer patients are either unaware or unsure if participation in clinical trials is an option. And of the few who are aware of the trials, most of these individuals believe clinical trial treatment would be less effective than standard care or that their insurance would not cover the costs. So something has to be done to change the public's perception of these trials. I know in southwestern Pennsylvania, the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center has received two grants to study these barriers and improve minority participation in clinical trials. This grant money is being used to essentially bring the trials to the patient through the utilization of teleconferencing, video equipment in outlying hospitals, providing modes of transportation to bring patients to trials and treatment, and working with other cancer centers and the hospitals outside of the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center system. Improving access and public perception of cancer clinical trials may seem to be an overwhelming task, but the doctors in my district are committed and excited about the cause. I'm looking forward to the witnesses' testimony on the various steps groups are voluntarily taking to achieve higher rates of participation as well as some of the problems they are confronting in their efforts. In addition, I appreciate the committee's efforts to raise national awareness of this issue crucial uh, to the future of medical innovation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you uh, very much. Ms. Get a lady from California, Ms. Watson. I, too, want to add my thanks to you, Mr. Chair, for bringing this issue up. Uh, I'm sure that uh, Congressman Waxman will remember that way back in the 80s, a group of us got together in the California legislature, a group of uh, females, when we found that the only uh, cancer testing was done on males and breast cancer was coming more into high profile. Uh, my statement uh, ends up this way, that uh, when you are making good public policy, it takes years because you have to educate. And so I thank you for gathering the witnesses here that will educate us to let us know that clinical trials are a must if we are going to make a dent in cancer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a great selection of witnesses today. In our first panel, we have Dr. Michelle Christian of the National Cancer Institute, uh, along with Dr. Richard Pazder from the Food and Drug Administration. They are going to provide the committee with an overview of the Federal Government's role in cancer clinical trials and highlight efforts the Government is taking to increase participation in clinical trials. It is the uh, uh, policy of the committee that we swear all witnesses, so if you just rise with me and raise your right hand. Thank you. Uh, solemnly swear the testimony you are about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. We are very privileged to have uh, both of you here today. Uh, your entire testimony is a part of the record and has been read. Uh, and what I would like to do is uh, we have some lights that will be in front of you. The green light is, uh, goes on for four minutes, then you get an orange light for a minute, and then red is the end of five. Try to sum up, and then we can move uh, right to questions because your entire statement is in the record. Uh, Dr. Christian, I will start with you and then to Dr. Pastor. Thanks for being with us. Um, good morning. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative uh, Waxman, and members for the opportunity uh, to discuss NCI's efforts to deliver innovative and effective cancer treatments to the public. I'm Michelle Shambly Christian, a medical oncologist and associate director of the Division of Cancer Treatment at the National Cancer Institute. I have slides, which are going to be hard to see, I think, on these screens, but you have hard copies. Cancer is actually more than 100 complex diseases, as, as depicted on this first slide, and cancer cells have many potential targets and pathways and processes that have been subverted by the malignant process. These differ in differ, different patients and different tumor types, yet because of our investment in basic research and advances in our understanding of biology, next slide, uh, we now have a growing list of new agents and chemical entities in clinical trials and unprecedented opportunities to make significant progress in the treatment and prevention of cancer. Next slide, please. NCI funds an ex 
That should not be the next slide. Yes, thank you. NCI funds an extensive clinical trial system, um, including over 3,000 clinical trial sites, more than 13,000 clinical investigators that accrue over 30,000 patients each year to trials. We study 138 uh, investigational or experimental drugs, and this system has been very effective at developing the treatments and defining the standards of care for patients we treat today and contributing to the fact that more patients with a diagnosis of cancer are living longer today. We also have 88 formal clinical trials agreements with the biopharmaceutical industry, which is the source of most of the promising new agents in clinical development today. Because of these extensive relationships, NCI is in a uh, unique position to sponsor clinical trials of combinations of investigational agents owned by different companies. NCI has worked with over a dozen industry collaborators to arrange more than 20 trials of novel investigational combinations to date and more are in development. Many of these regimens would not have been evaluated until one or more of the agents had received FDA marketing approval, potentially resulting in years of delay. Why is this important? Next slide, please. The cartoon, no, that's not the next slide. Okay, well, these are not uh, in the correct order. <laughs> No, those are the wrong slides. All right, well, you have copies of the slides. We're going to try to do this without the slides. Um, the cartoon that I was going to show you just depicts one of the co common problems and challenges with the targeted therapy of cancer, and that is that there are multiple branching and redundant signal pathways that control the behavior of cancer cells, and it is widely believed that many of the most promising new molecularly targeted agents will demonstrate their optimal utility in combinations that inhibit or modulate multiple targets in these critical pathways, blocking progression of cancer. So we need to be able to give these um, simultaneously, and that's why these combinations are important. Next slide. Nope. All right, I wanted to tell you the components of the clinical trials program. There is an extensive early clinical trials program, um, which is comprised of phase one and phase two clinical trials done via contracts and grants at academic centers. There are numerous translational research components that conduct the correlative laboratory studies on blood and tumor specimens from patients so that in clinical trials we may learn not only whether a treatment works but how it works so that we can select future patients uh, better for um, treatment. The map that you saw up there at one point um, represents the um, distribution of these clinical trial sites around the country and um, shows a, a very broad and, I think, um, good distribution of these sites. The next slide uh, should have been on um, cooperative group funding. Um, since funding for clinical trials is an issue, and points out that during the period from fiscal year 98 to 03, funding uh, to the cooperative group program increased by 62 percent. NCI was asked to comment on why um, cooperative groups are not fully funded at the levels recommended by peer review, and I wanted to point out that the cooperative group grants um, are amongst the largest in NCI's portfolio. Um, and in addition, each phase three trial that we sponsor costs anywhere from two to ten million dollars depending on its size. Our groups undergo peer review once every six years where plans for the next six years are reviewed along with the requested budget. Um, however, this is a projected plan and a provisional budget because it's not possible to predict which clinical trials will actually be conducted three, four, or five years in the future. Um, so peer review recommendations are one component of effective coordination and stewardship that NCI staff consider in arriving at a funding plan. And the next slide, I wanted to show you that during this same period, accrual to clinical trials also rose dramatically by 24 percent in the phase three program and importantly uh, by 58 percent as shown in the light blue bars in the early clinical trials program. And that's important because that's where many of these promising new agents and combinations that will be evaluated in phase three trials are actually studied. So um, my final slide just also points out um, that there are a number of ongoing initiatives at NCI to broaden access to clinical trials for patients and to facilitate physician participation. The slide lists uh, a, a number of them. 
Um, and I wanted to just um, comment also that in, in closing, NCI is committed to, inf to effectively integrating its clinical trials mechanisms in order to make smarter use of the available resources and to ensure that we are optimally positioned to take advantage of emerging scientific and medical opportunities, speed accrual to the highest priority clinical trials, um, and accelerate the delivery of promising new approaches to cancer prevention and treatment to the American public. I thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Doctor. Dr. Pastor, thanks for being with us. Uh, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I am Richard Pastor, MD, the Director of the Division of Oncology Drug Products at the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research at the Food and Drug Administration. Dr. Patricia Keegan, the Director of the Division of Therapeutic Biological Oncology Products at CEDAR, is accompanying me today to answer any questions on biological products. I am pleased to be with you today to discuss with our, what our agency is do, doing to accelerate the delivery of innovative cancer treatments to meet the needs of cancer patients and their families. FDA's mission is to ensure that new cancer drugs are safe and effective. We also facilitate access to promising therapies for seriously ill and dying patients when no other treatment is available. Since the FDA last tes testified before this committee in June 2000, a number of important cancer drugs have been approved and are helping cancer patients. Of particular note are the number of innovative drugs that are targeted to specific parts of the cancer cells. These new therapies are a glimpse of the future of cancer therapy and should be a source of encouragement to the American public and to cancer patients and their families. FDA has numerous programs in place to help speed the development and approval of promising drugs to cancer patients. Let me briefly mention some of these programs. Under the accelerated approval route, FDA can approve drugs for serious or life-threatening conditions. These drugs demonstrate the potential to address unmet medical needs based on a surrogate endpoint that is, quote, reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit. Secondly, priority review is intended to direct overall FDA review attention and resources to the evaluation of applications for products that have the potential for providing significant therapeutic advances. Thirdly, a drug sponsor may request fast-track status. This designation facilitates the investigational development and the approval of drugs that provide significant advancements in the treatment of serious or life-threatening diseases. These programs have been instrumental in shortening the time to approval for many promising cancer drugs. However, the FDA is aware that there is growing concern that many of the new basic science discoveries made in recent years may not quickly yield more effective, affordable, and safe medical products for patients. This is because the current medical product development path is becoming increasingly challenging. During the last several years, the number of new drugs and biological applications submitted to the FDA has declined significantly. The number of innovative medical device applications has also decreased. In response, on March 16, 2004, the FDA released a report entitled, Advancing America's Health, Advancing Medical Breakthroughs. We refer to this FDA report as a critical path. This timely paper calls for academic researchers, product developers, and patient groups to work with the FDA to identify ways to modernize tools for speeding approval, innovative products to the market to improve public health. The report provides FDA's analysis of the current prop pipeline problem, the recent slowdown instead of the expected acceleration in innovative medical therapies reaching patients. FDA is planning an initiative that will identify and prioritize the most pressing development problems and secondly, the areas that provide the greatest opportunities for rapid development and public health benefits. This will be done for all three dimensions along the critical pathways, namely safety assessment, evaluation of medical utility, and product industrialization. We will work together with stakeholders to identify the most important challenges. 
Concurrently, FDA will refocus its internal efforts to ensure that we are working on the most important problems and intensify our support of key projects. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss these important issues with you. I would be happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you both. Uh, let me start. You can start my five minutes. Um, the witnesses in our, um, Dr. Christian, the witnesses on our second panel today, they're going to cite uh, lack of physician education as a barrier uh, to adequate accrual in clinical trials. Uh, you talked briefly, but I wonder if you could elaborate on, on what efforts uh, National Cancer Institute's taken to inform physicians about the Cancer Trial Support Unit Program. I mean, it seems to me that's where the word needs to get out. People go see their doctor, they get the diagnosis, they want a list of options. Uh, I, I think you'd just be teaming with people who want to get in on the latest and be a part of this. But it really starts and ends with the physician uh, that they're treating who really gives them uh, their menu of options. Well, I think that's absolutely correct. And the um, uh, NCI and the Cancer Trial Support Unit have worked um, with a number of organizations, the um, Coalition for Cooperative Groups being one, since they're intimately involved in that, but also with the American Society for Clinical Oncology and others to make physicians aware of the opportunities to participate in, in trials through the Cancer Trial Support Unit. They also use electronic uh, well, systems. Let me ask this. In continuing medical education, I think you have requirements of that. I don't know if you have it in every state, but in most states. Is this part of it? Uh, well, to my knowledge, it's not part of uh, continuing medi medical education requirements. It is, we do there. offer uh, sessions, however, at a national meetings so that uh, there are educational opportunities there, but uh, it's not a requirement per se. Yeah, I mean, it just seems to me when you're going in for, you know, every year to get updated, you ought to, it just, that menu of options is pretty easy to include it. If I were a physician, I'd sure want to know it uh, and, and give it, uh, be able to give my patients that option particularly some of those that uh, don't have a lot of good options as you, you're working on. Um, Can I just elaborate yeah, also please. that we, we have um, also, uh, working with the cooperative groups and others, um, invested quite heavily in patient education because having patients be aware of clinical trials and request those opportunities of their physicians I think is another way to um, approach this problem. And so we've, we've I think, all made major efforts to uh, improve the education of uh, patients about these opportunities. I think you touched briefly, but um, Dr. Comus in our next panel is going to testify that National Cancer Institute only reimburses physicians about $2,000 per case to perform research at a community-based physician practices, while studies suggest the cost is closer to $4,000. Um, is it possible in working with NCI's budget to increase the allocation to offset these costs? Physician um, reimbursements are low on everything. This is, a, no, this is an area where you really don't want to do it on the cheap. If you well, um, the cost at a site for conducting clinical trials has been a subject of great interest and concern to us. During um, the um, five-year period that I showed on my slide, um, there was a 62 percent increase in, accrual, in, in uh, funding to the group system overall. But in, importantly, I think, the funding to the sites actually doubled during that period. So while $2,000 remains um, perhaps meager, it represented a substantial increase in what we had been able to fund previously. So we, you know, we um, are continuing to seek ways to increase funding and to think about how best to allocate the clinical trials resources that we have um, uh, overall so that we get the work done. And there are a number of groups, Dr. Comus and I work on several of them, that are actually trying to nail down much much more precisely what the real components of cost are so that we can make, I think, more effective judgments in terms of how we're able to fund. I don't mean to single you out. I mean, our reimbursements that we allocate to physicians under Medicare and Medicaid are, are pitiful, so I hear you. Yeah, Dr. Pazzer. I just wanted to jump in. Having done clinical trials for almost 20 years, there is a difference between knowing if they exist, okay, and actually doing them, okay? And I think people have to understand that the enrollment of a patient when one is conducting a busy practice is a very time-consuming activity. It requires infrastructure to be present. It requires data managers. It requires research nurses. So there has to be an infrastructure within a clinician's practice that will allow him to do the, the uh, clinical trials that he views to be um, of importance. 
uh, it is an issue, and I, I think when we take a look at the whole issue of why patients do not partic in participate in clinical trials, to leave out the physician component is one that uh, would not be appropriate. It is, as you pointed out, the physician that ultimately will be prescribing the therapy that uh, the patient will be getting. And he has to have the appropriate incentives and also the infrastructure that will allow him to place patients on trial. Let me ask you, just so I know, understand that, how many investigational products fail in clinical trials? I mean, the ratio compared to products approved, any idea? Ballpark? I could, uh, the vast majority of them. It's a small, uh, probably our critical pathway states that one, if you take five drugs that are being developed in their very earliest stages, probably one will make it to the market. Okay. Thank, thank you uh, very much. Mr. Wiseman. Uh, Dr. Christian, um, the clinical trials cooperative group program at NCI. Uh, they play a key role in clinical research against cancer, and I know you're familiar with that. And studies by these uh, networks of researchers have led to major advances in survival, particularly in the pediatric cancers. But uh, we have a chart showing that the funding for this program has not increased in the last several years. And Dr. Comas, who is chair of the Coalition National Cancer Cooperative Groups, is going to testify that current funding stifles innovation, destabilizes key functions such as our tissue banks, data management, and informatics platforms, and acts as a disincentive to both academic and community physician participation. And you can see from that chart, there's a, a decrease for uh, leukemia, gynecologic oncology, breast and bowel cancer. Uh, how, how do you respond to, to, view, to the view that this important research program is threatened? Well, um, I can't see the details there, but my slide sh um, also covered, I think, some of those years. And as I point out, we actually substantially increased funding over a significant portion of that time. Now, that said, I think that there is no doubt that um, the costs for enrolling a patient at a site still are not being uh, reimbursed at the proper rate. I think that that um, is something that we continue to need to address. Um, you know, I think that uh, there are many components of the clinical trials program. There is the cooperative group program, which is extremely important, as you point out. But there are many other critical elements, too. And I think that given all of the new targeted agents that are coming into the clinic, um, the early clinical trials are extremely important, too, in advancing regimens to the point that they can go to phase three trials. And, and indeed, many of those have been uh, funded at, at much higher rates. And in fact, new resources have been created to try to get those new novel agents into a, to a point where they could go into phase three trials. Do you agree so, that with less money and rising expenses, the cooperative groups will have a harder time recruiting patients and doctors to their clinical trials? I think that with less money at each site, that would be true. And our approach to that, actually, is to look at the entire clinical trials program and find ways to better integrate to um, make the costs of putting patients on clinical trials lower by um, having consistent um, and standard approaches to data collection and other things that cost time and money. Uh, data managers, as Dr. Pazder pointed out, are, are, are one important component. So we're trying to look across the system and find places where we can better integrate, conserve resources, and then allocate them to the places that, that need them the most so that we okay. can indeed raise the funding at the sites where the research is actually being done. G given the NCI's emphasis on the genetics of cancer and the importance of tissue banks, uh, what is NCI doing to enhance the role of the tissue banks run by the cooperative groups? And well, NCI actually um, has put forward a, a request recently for um, uh, proposals for funding for uh, tissue banks. So we are planning not only to increase the funding for tissue banks, because we agree that it is a really critical component of this research, um, but to actually stabilize that funding by awarding grants specifically to that purpose. So rather than just general cooperative group funding, we're going to provide additional funds specifically targeted at uh, to tumor banks uh, in our cooperative groups. As NCI reorganizes itself to deal with the challenges of the future, I think it's important not to undermine the, uh, those resources, such as the cooperative groups that are the bedrock of our clinical research efforts, and I'm sure you agree with that as well. I agree, absolutely. Uh, Dr. Uh, Posner, uh, clinical trials are 
are a key tool in our fight against uh, cancer. Uh, but they also uh, can provide one of the few sources of hope for those people who have failed standard tr uh, treatment options. And the website, www.clinicaltrials.gov, is a searchable online registry of clinical trials that patients with serious or life-threatening uh, disease and illness and their providers can use to see if they are eligible for, for participation. I I'm sure you're familiar with this website. Okay. Now, federal law requires that the sponsor of any effectiveness study conducted under uh, an investigational new drug proposal register with the database within 21 days of the start of the patient enrollment. In April 2003, FDA reported that many sponsors of clinical studies of cancer treatments had not submitted the information to the registry, while 91 percent of NIH and NCI-sponsored studies had been posted only 47 percent of industry-sponsored studies had been posted, even though FDA had released a detailed guidance for industry in March of 2002. Do you think increased industry compliance would benefit patients? The answer to your question is emphatically yes. We also are greatly concerned about the low participation of industry in listing their trials uh, on uh, www.cancertrials.gov. Uh, we've taken a concerted effort to try to find why, what is the reason, and I really don't have a good reason at that time if I could say, you know, this is the reason why uh, industry is not placing studies uh, on um, on, on the, the website. One would think they would have every reason to place the, uh, their trials so. on. If we're talking about poor accrual to clinical trials, industry can cry about poor accrual to clinical trials if they're not putting it on the website. Uh, in our own division and uh, at the FDA in general, after every phase two meeting and industry meeting, we have a written bullet that come, uh, is part of the minutes to the, that meeting uh, that specifically informs the sponsor of the existence uh, and their obligation to list the website. That is a written part of the minutes of every end of phase two meeting. Uh, we've had taken concerted efforts to talk to patients patient groups uh, to encourage uh, patient advocates to advocate uh, for participation uh, of commercial sponsors to list their trials. Uh, in addition to that, we've taken a concerted effort of talking to industry about this. There may be some concerns of confidentiality in listing clinical trials on www.clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, I really don't buy that. Yeah. Mr. Waxman. Well, I'm disappointed we couldn't get a pharma representative to come in and testify today. It's ironic that while they're refusing to comply fully with the government website, pharma has a website, and on, on that pharma website, uh, there, there's a, there are, um, uh, it's called uh, New Medicines and Development, and um, the, um, on the pharma website, they'll often list clinical trials that they're not offer, uh, listing on the government website, uh, but on their website, they frequently don't include eligibility details on clinical trial, trials or provide contact information for the trials. I, I, I don't know why companies may list information about studies in a format that, that's not useful to the patients because you want, if you read about it, you want to find out more about it, yeah. there's no uh, contact information. What is FDA going to do to enforce participation in the website? Uh, at this point, we obviously have a process where we're communicating with the sponsors. We're trying to find out reasons why they are not putting uh, pay, uh, putting the um, the trials on this. We have begun an education program, as I pointed out. We're uh, at every meeting. We are asking them and informing them of their obligation to do so. Uh, in addition to that, we have a massive process during professional education to encourage physicians and to encourage patients to utilize this resource. Uh, we are somewhat limited on what we can do. Uh, we can educate. We can talk. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Waxman. Judge Carter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Richard Nixon was President of the United States in 1970 and he declared war on cancer. 
Uh, he said we were going to, he said our goal was to cure cancer in our lifetime. Well, he's dead. Uh, we haven't, we haven't even come close. We've spent $52.5 billion under the theory that government had, this, could come up with a solution. Uh, and it's my understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that if you view the overall, uh, overall war on cancer, uh, it's been a pretty bad failure. We have, if you compare it to other wars we've in health areas, like like heart disease, for instance, that there's been a much more success. Uh, is there is there some? Are we doing something wrong in our direction on the war on cancer as you see it? Uh, that's a question that's really concerning me because where I come from, there's a lot of folks dying of cancer, uh, and uh, they don't see a whole lot of hope and they don't see a whole lot of success. Do either one of you want to comment on where, why this isn't $52 billion in 35 years hasn't succeeded in any way? I hear you. Okay. Uh, I sympathize wholeheartedly having had patients and family members with this disease. I, I think it's important for us to understand that cancer is not one disease. As Michelle pointed out, it, at this time we could say it's a hundred disease, but probably it's even many more diseases on a molecular basis. The riddle of cancer, I feel, is far, far more complicated than, for example, the problems that we face with HIV infections, where we know the etiology, we know the virus that uh, is causing the problems. For most cancers, we have very limited or rudimentary knowledge of what causes the cancer, um, and even sometimes the natural history and the variations. For example, even what we call breast cancer probably is hundreds and hundreds of different diseases. The problem is the science. We have to make scientific advances, and that is on the basic level. We are beginning to do so, I feel, by understanding the genetic causes of cancer. We've seen some drugs that have dramatically change the face of some diseases. While you are entirely right, if you took a look at the entire scope, scope of cancer, one would have to look at it somewhat pessimistically. However, there are some diseases, for example, CML, a disease when I began my medical career that was uniformly fatal with drugs that we used from the 1950s to treat it, which now we have a drug called Gleevec, uh, which transform that disease into probably a chronic uh, disease. One can't use the word cure at this time with many of these diseases, but truly was an important theoretical, uh, important medical development. Why did we develop this drug? What gave us the capabilities? It was the basic understanding of the genetics of the disease, the molecular pathogenesis of the disease, and marrying that basic understanding of the disease with a therapy that interacted here. And I think that is going to be the overriding principle as we take a look at newer drugs. Understanding the disease on a molecular basis and then drugs that are targeted toward molecular abnormalities or mole molecular deficiencies. This is an area that I think is evolving, uh, and I am somewhat pessimistic with the past, but on the future I'm very optimistic that we are exactly, or we are now beginning to have the tools that will enable us to move forward. Uh, I went last, uh, about, th about three weeks ago, Lance Armstrong has a cancer survivor group in, in Austin, Texas, and I went to that, and it was very uplifting about all these cancer survivors, but when you cut through it, the definition of a cancer survivor is they survived the first round, really. There's an awful lot of people there that, that although they are in remission right now, uh, they, they face the, the, the distinct possibility of seeing the cancer again uh, and it ultimately killing them. And, and you know, if, where I stand from, Cure of cancer means you get you go in, you get treated, and you're not going to have cancer that cancer at least again, uh, and and so we're not we haven't reached that point. I understand on almost anything, but maybe childhood leukemia may be one we've got a, a hand on to some extent. Well, uh, so I, I'm just concerned about that much money and that much time and that little success, and I'm wondering, uh, do uh, do is there something innovative we can look at? that would, would stimulate the challenge of the market to go out to win cancer. I, I firmly believe that if I could invent something to cure cancer, I could be 
you know, richer than Microsoft. And, and uh, I think we ought to be able, we, we ought to, somebody ought to be able to come up with some incentive to do that. And a question I want to raise, I don't realize my time's gone, Mr. Chairman, with a few more minutes. The question I want to raise is, is the way we handle our intellectual properties issue on the development of drugs, is that becoming a stumbling block to giving incentive for, for, for private enterprise to take on full-fledged the challenge of cancer treatment, i.e., it takes you, what, nine, ten years to approve a cancer drug. Uh, gives you another nine years to recover your cost if you're in the business of inventing that or, or creating that cancer drug. Uh, could we change our intellectual property laws to give a longer time after approval while, where, you, where you still had the assurance of a trademark or patent, which might enhance the ability of private industry to invest the kind of money they're going to need to invest to go into fighting cancer? How do you feel about that? Um, I'd like to comment on that, and then I'd like to comment also on your previous question. You know, I think that um, um, intellectual property issues are certainly um, a, a problem, particularly um, for combination treatments, um, particularly when um, we want to look at a much broader range of um, cancers than um, the more narrowly focused um, FDA approval pathway, for example. Um, and, you know, I think it is possible that incentives might encourage industry to work more broadly uh, with NCI, with each other, um, et cetera, so that we can do the combinations and do the broader development that will speed up this whole process. So I think that there are um, issues there that are probably um, worth uh, looking at. I mean, we, we, for example, have been following the uh, Best Pharmaceuticals for Children Act to see what the impact of, of that might be on um, drug development, and I think that will give us uh, some notion. So I, I think intellectual property um, um, is probably an issue that, that uh, um, warrants further thought. Um, with regard to um, where we are uh, with cancer, though, you know, I, I do want to point out that there are, um, you know, a growing list of tumors where we actually do cure patients and do prolong survival by adding treatment uh, to surgery. Um, you know, I think 20 years ago the list was uh, negligible, and now there's a growing list of situations where we actually do cure patients. Um, and many more where we prolong their lives. So um, your pessimism I understand, but we, we have made progress. And I think, like Rick, that given the array of new entities that we have to, to use and to develop at this moment, molecularly targeted entities, I am more optimistic than I've been in 20 years of therapeutics development that we actually may make fundamental molecular strides. And, I, the, of course, the case that he gave with Gleevec and chronic myelogenous leukemia is one example. The reason that the numbers remain so daunting is that the major solid tumors, lung cancer, colon cancer, are much more complex molecularly. And so we're going to take a little bit longer, I think, to sort out what the relevant uh, targets there are. But it's very interesting. In two major medical journals this past month, um, the New England Journal of Medicine and Science, there were articles um, uh, about a, a mutation found in patients with lung cancer which may help explain how we should better use some of these new targeted agents that we're investigating. And it was the first such article. So we're really very optimistic, again, that we're entering a period where we really are going to understand the molecular nature of these tumors and how to treat them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Mr. Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a lot of questions to see what I can get through here. Um, first of all, there's some, been some frustration in the Hillman Cancer Center in Pittsburgh, and they're trying to recruit minority members for these studies. Um, and these are more than just racial minorities. These are also social economic minorities, uh, getting them to sites. Um, uh, statistically speaking, are there, do you believe there's significantly fewer minorities in studies on cancer trials uh, nationwide? Is that a concern? Is there other things we need to be doing to recruit? Um, people various income levels, a wide range of income levels, et cetera? Um, <clears throat> there are, um, 
There are some um, um, situations with NCI-sponsored clinical trials where minorities are not accrued in proportion to the numbers that uh, one would expect based on the prevalence of the cancer, for example. That's particularly true of African-American men. It's true of Asian men and women. It's true of Hispanic uh, men and women. Um, <clears throat> And there are an, a lot of efforts ongoing, uh, both in NCI-sponsored trials and at the cancer centers, University of Pittsburgh being one, that has a funded grant to actually to look at what some of the barriers are to accrual um, for racial and ethnic minorities and for people uh, of uh, lower socioeconomic status and for the elderly, which are also underrepresented on clinical trials. So um, this is an issue that's important to us, and we um, are approaching it from a variety of different uh, uh, perspectives. Um, in our cancer centers, I think, um, for reasons that are not altogether clear to me, there are um, some even greater disparities. So they have an even harder time than we do to our national trials, um, accruing what would seem to be a representative and reasonable number of uh, minorities. We, I chair actually the um, task force for the American Society of uh, Clinical Oncology on uh, health disparities and workforce diversity. And, I, you know, there are many issues that have to do with trust in communities, with, which have to do with the very, very low representation of uh, minority medical professionals um, who might be able to reach these communities um, in uh, new, more effective ways. So there, there are many issues. Um, I think it is an important problem and one that we need to continue aggressively to try to address. Let me, let me uh, move on to another area here that's important, and that has to do with uh, the issue involving people who may have insurance. Some states, like uh, California, requires insurance companies to cover um, clinical trials, and many other insurance companies will simply say they're not going to cover anything experimental. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what other states, in addition to California, have these laws. My question is this. Has there been a cost-benefit analysis on these things? Because there's times when um, people feel they're, they, they're desperate and they want to try anything, and the insurance company may say, no, we're not going to cover that. There's simply no efficacy to support this, and it appears to be very expensive. Have we done any sort of analysis overall? Is that ongoing? There have been a couple of um, uh, studies looking at the incremental co costs of uh, care on clinical trials, which have shown that they are not significantly higher um, than care delivered outside of clinical what, trials. What does significantly higher mean? Um, I don't remember what the actual dollar amounts were. Do you have? Do you remember that? A rough idea of percentage. Yeah, five five percent or something. I can certainly provide the precise details, but the estimate is around 5 percent. Um, so, I mean, we, we have attempted to look at those incremental costs, but I think in addition there are other important uh, things to consider here. Patients are going to be treated, and uh, um, the treatments um, in the community um, may or may not be as well developed, as well um, based in evidence, um, and so there are costs associated with delivering. Plus you have differences in communities that may have a university medical center versus what might be on a community that may not be near some of those uh, more advanced research. Uh, but Those community, I mean, there are community participants in clinical trials, but there are also the vast majority of patients who are treated outside of clinical trials who are just treated in private practice settings. And um, there, the evidence for which, on, on which the treatments are based um, may or may not be as, as sound as that in the clinical trial. So I think there are a lot of things you have to take into account, but the cost uh, concern. I think um, there is growing evidence that it should not be an impediment to providing those um, those opportunities for patients uh, through their health insurance coverage. Thank you. That's all I have for this point. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to also thank you for holding this hearing. Um, and I, this is a subject that I'm very much interested in. Uh, Dr. Christian, uh, the you know, I, uh, in my district, I have Johns Hopkins, and I also have uh, the University of Maryland um, Hospital. And one of the things that, in trying to get people involved in trials, not just for cancer, but trials, period, African Americans, is that there is a tremendous, and I think you mentioned it a moment ago in response to a question, a tremendous distrust. 
Uh, people cite the Tuskegee experiment. My mother, for example, says of one of those hospitals, if she is in dire straits on her deathbed, don't stop there. And that's because they have seen and had rumors, at least, of African Americans who were experimented upon. And it causes them not to want, many people, not to want to um, be a part of any kind of experiment. And so even when the argument is made <clears throat> that some of what they may have heard in the past isn't absolutely true, what seems to happen just when we get to a point, like for example with AIDS, to, for people to finally get right there at the doorstep to participate, something happens. Uh, we have a situation, we'll be having a hearing here on the 18th where another hospital in my district uh, tested some uh, 2,500 patients and come to find out for AIDS and hepatitis C and come to find out the results. Uh, the machinery was um, malfunctioning. People knew it was malfunctioning and nobody did anything about it. So then when they hear that kind of information, it makes it even worse. So they say, wait a minute, you know, we got, you're talking about AIDS and hepatitis C, things that could be life-threatening, and you mean to tell me, I went to, people have gone to a hospital, gotten results that may not be accurate, and nobody even waved a red flag. So I was wondering, you know, and I think that this is a situation that probably exists uh, all over the country. Um, and then, of course, with the whole issue of health care disparities in the Congressional Black Caucus, our number one, one of our number one issues is health care disparities. African American people, as you well know, dying uh, early, suffering needlessly. And as a matter of fact, just recently uh, I was in an, or in an audience of about, I'd say about 400 African Americans in my district. And I asked how many of them uh, believed in the last five ye be within the last five years that they had a relative to die earlier than they should have because of some medical follow-up, or to suffer serious injury because of, of something like that. And three-fifths of them raised their hand. And I can cite situations in my own family at least four or five that I know things like that have happened. So the question becomes, how do you deal with, how does, and, and we in the Congress, we, we not only have these hats that we wear here sitting on these panels, but we also take up the bully pulpit, trying to get our constituents to do the right thing. Even when we pass legislation, we still want them to get out there and take the uh, the colon test and to do all those things that stay healthy. How do you say and how do you guarantee, not guarantee, but how you, do you assure people it's okay? Particularly when they have these thoughts embedded in the DNA of every cell of their brain. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about this a little bit. I grew up in a medical family and Tuskegee was very real to us too. Uh, and it was a real phenomenon. Um, but I think that there have been many years since Tuskegee, and um, there are many new protections for patients. I can assure you for NCI-sponsored trials, for example, that they are reviewed exhaustively uh, by experts in the management of the cancer that we're talking about, by people at the National Cancer Institute, um, and by institutional review boards and others to ensure that the nature of the research is reasonable and ethical. That said, um, there clearly are health disparities across the entire spectrum of medical care. Um, I actually tell patients that um, on a clinical trial, patients get the same treatment as everybody else. It's prescribed. It's written in a protocol. Exactly what needs to be done is written there, and patients are treated according to that protocol. Um, 
and we audit those sites. We go to the place and we look at the records and we make sure patients were treated the way they were supposed to be treated on the protocol. So there are even additional protections. So there are many protections in place that I think uh, make participation in an NCI-sponsored cl uh, clinical trial a safe and reasonable thing. I think it's important for um, minority communities to benefit from the opportunity to participate and from the, the knowledge that is gained. There are concerns about whether there may be differences in the way um, various racial groups um, handle drugs, for example. We won't know that if we don't study them. We won't know that if we don't participate in trials. And so when the new drug is then approved for the treatment of uh, some cancer, we won't know whether that actually benefits us as it does the rest of the, of the population. I think it's important for us to be a part of that and to have the opportunity to have those treatments um, and, um, and to, you know, aggressively pursue those opportunities so that we are sure, at least in that venue, that we are getting comparable care. So that's, that's what I um, tell patients. I don't think patients should be, feel coerced to do it, but I think the opportunity should be made available to them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me just ask one final question, uh, Dr. Uh, Pastor. You raised the concern in your testimony that the development of new cancer treatments will make clinical trials more costly and complicated. How do we address the concern uh, as the criteria for enrollment in trials becomes based more on a patient's biological characteristics than the clinical ones? Well, I think what the eligibility criteria of the protocol will say patients must overexpress a particular enzyme, for example. Um, and then patients will be enrolled that have that particular uh, expression of the target that is aimed at. Uh, I look at this as a benefit to patients, to drug development, and to drug regulation. Because one of the problems, obviously, that we have in oncology today is even our most effective drugs are relatively modest in their response rate or in their clinical efficacy. So if we can predefine an enriched population that is more likely to benefit from the drug, that efficacy will be greater expressed. We'll have higher response rates. We'll have higher time to progression, better survival. Um, and I, therefore, I look at it as a positive aspect for the whole area of drug development. And I don't literally look at it as an obstacle at all. I look at it as a positive thing. Okay. Thank you both. Uh, uh, Dr. Christian, thank you as well. Uh, you've been very, very helpful. And I will uh, allow you to go now. We'll move to our second panel. Thank you very much. And before we do that, I want to welcome my colleague from New Jersey, uh, uh, Representative Scott Garrett, to our hearing. And uh, we'll take a two-minute break as we just switch the here and then, I'm Dr. Garrett. I'm going to allow you to um, introduce uh, one, of, one of our panel members. Oh, I see. Mr. Garrett, ready to come back into order. I'm pleased to have our colleague uh, from New Jersey uh, here with us today. Uh, Mr. Garrett, you're recognized. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I appreciate the opportunity to introduce um, Dr. Andy Picora, who is a 20-year veteran of the war on cancer. Um, 
When I first met him, I knew a little bit about his background. Now I know a whole lot more about his background. I would like to share that uh, with the panel. He is a uh, graduate of uh, uh, Seton Hall back in 79, went on to receive his medical degree from the University of Medicine and Dentistry in New Jersey, great state of New Jersey, in 1983. Completed his residency over at the New York Hospital, Cornell um, Hospital Systems, and then moved on to the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and completed a fellowship in hematology and oncology in 1989, after which he moved on to Hackensack University Medical Center to serve as director of hematology and oncology and the adult blood and marrow transplant program, and now has recently been promoted to chairman and director of the Cancer Center at Hackensack University Medical Center. He is a uh, diplomat of the American Board of Internal Medicine uh, with subspecialties in hematology and subspecialties in oncology, and he has received numerous awards and honors, uh, some of which include the Women's Guild Pre-Medical Academic Achievement Scholarship back in 78, uh, in 1979 the Academic Excellence Award in Biology, uh, in 83 the uh, Doctors Milton and Rose Pachkowski Award for Overall Excellence in Patient Care, uh, and then the Outstanding Teacher Award from the Department of Internal Medicine at Hackensack University Medical Center in 89. And for all doctors, I think this is important, he's selected as one of the best doctors in America in 1997, 1998, and 2000 and 2003. And then received the American Cancer Society Physicians in the Forefront Award and the Susan G. Komen Breast Cancer Foundation Award as a hero in the fight against breast cancer. He received the EBMT ESMO Award at the International Conference on High Dose Chemotherapy in Breast and Ovarian Cancer. His uh, professional positions include uh, such things as the scientific advisor for the companies ProNeuron and ProVirus. In addition, he has co-founded and served as chairman and chief executive officer of Progenitor Cell Therapy, and now serves on the board of directors of the American Society of Bone Marrow Transplant, and previously on the International Society of Hemotherapy and Graft Engineering. Uh, the Hackensack University Medical Center, IPA, and served as chairman of the medical board and board members of the Affiliated Physician Network. Uh, in addition to these things, he served as chairman of the Transplantation Committee on the International Society of Hemotherapy and Graft Engineering, and has served as a member of the Cancer Institute of New Jersey Protocol Advisory Committee. And recently, he was appointed to the Steering Committee on the Transplant Treatment Trials Group and he's a fellow of the Academic Academy of Medicine of New Jersey and a fellow of the American College of Physicians and American Society of Clinical Oncology and American Society of Hematology. And finally, the uh, doctor has been involved in numerous research projects in an effort to improve the outcome of patients with cancer. His recent work includes the production of stem cell products that are free of contaminating malignant cells using technology including CD34 selection, in ex vivo or ex vivo expansion. Uh, he has had led several national trials in the field of transplantation and has published numerous peer-reviewed articles and abstracts and has presented the results of his re research at many national and international scientific meetings. And uh, probably most important, he is married and has three great children and resides in the fair state of New Jersey in the beautiful town of Ridgewood. And we welcome you to the panel. Well, thank, thank you, you very much, uh, Dr. Pecora. Thank you very much. Uh, we're joined here today with uh, Dr. Robert Comas, who is president of the Coalition of National Cancer Cooperative Groups, he is a professor of medicine and director at the MCP Hahnemann University Clinical Trials Research Center in Philadelphia, and Ms. Ellen Stovall, who is a 28-year survivor of two bouts with cancer and president and CEO of the National Coalition for Cancer Survivorship. Uh, this panel of witnesses is going to provide the committee with their perspective on the seriousness of low accrual levels in cancer clinical trials uh, and what efforts are being taken to improve outcomes in cancer patients. Uh, obviously a very distinguished panel. We appreciate all of you being with us. Uh, it is our policy to swear everyone in, so if you'd rise with me. Raise your right hands. Salome, swear the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. What we will uh, do is that, uh, your entire statement is already part of the record. Um, Dr. Pecora, I'll start with you, uh, try to move to do it within five minutes. Uh, we have your lights there that turn orange after four minutes, red after five, um, and then we'll go straight down the line and then we'll move to questions. And, and thank you all very much for being with us. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Garrett, for your kind words. 
Uh, first and foremost, thank you, Chairman Davis and distinguished committee members for providing me the opportunity to participate in this important hearing that hopefully will result in actions leading to improved outcomes for people afflicted with cancer. I have been active in the war on cancer for over 20 years, participating in basic science, clinical trials, and now cancer care administration. I welcome the opportunity to share my ideas on why and how increasing participation in clinical trials, regardless of the status of innovation, will improve outcomes for people suffering with cancer. We all well know that over the past 35 years, government, industry, and the public have spent billions of dollars to create and operate the agencies that oversee and fund efforts in basic and clinical discovery aimed to improve outcomes for people battling cancer. As a result, substantial advances have been made in the understanding of the biology of cancer, and as a consequence, new and more effective treatments have emerged. Unfortunately, even with this focus and extensively funded effort, cancer remains a serious problem. This year in the United States alone, cancer is expected to claim more than 500,000 lives. The criticism of our, thus, criticism of our current system exists. In a recent article in Fortune magazine authored by Clifton Leaf, significant criticism is levied at the cancer research community, community claiming the culture is dysfunctional and that the search for knowledge has supplanted the search for cures, leading to discoveries of marginal benefit regardless of, the, of a great expense of time and money. I believe, however, that these claims are only partially correct and that as a consequence of our national effort, it is now within our reach to turn cancer in most cases into a chronic disease, much like diabetes, while searches for prevention and cures continue. As Mr. Leaf eloquently points out in his article, we must make the entire system of discovery and application of new agents more efficient. Clearly, continued improvements in our understanding of the underlying root causes of cancer and methods of detection of efficacy and safety are essential. Of equal importance, however, is active and robust participation by people with cancer in clinical trials. No matter how promising a therapy appears in laboratory testing, it is only through clinical trials that safety and effectiveness can be established in people. Simply stated, no person or computer program is capable of predicting whether a new treatment will work and be safe in people. In my current experience, it is not the lack of good ideas that is slowing progress in our quest to cure cancer, but is much more a result of the slow pace of completing active clinical trials. In 2003, there were approximately 1,700 ongoing clinical trials, of which the NCI sponsored 1,200. Despite this large number of trials, only 3% of adult patients participated, while 20% were eligible. Low participation in clinical trials slows the continuum of drug development from initial concept to FDA-approved products, and as a consequence, impedes improvement of outcomes for people with cancer. In addition, poor participation in clinical trials lengthens the new drug approval process, estimated now at 10 to 12 years, and has the cascade effect of increasing new drug development costs now estimated at 800 million, inflating the cost of drugs to consumers once approved, and worst of all, limiting the number of new agents that make it through uh, uh, the, the process of the discovery pipeline. Advances in knowledge which will lead to better questions should continue to be supported, but at the same time, we need to improve participation in clinical trials. So what can we do about it? Lack of participation is due to several factors that can and should be addressed a lack of public knowledge of availability of clinical trials, and a growing public bias against participation due to poor outcome high-profile cases is a key factor. Government should do everything it can to educate the public on the value and importance of participating in clinical trials. In an era of, of shrinking reimbursement for clinical care, funding needs to be established for clinical programs, both hospital and office-based, to support the required infrastructure, including research staff and informatics, to participate in clinical trials. Reductions in the growing regulatory burden, including centralization of institutional review boards, streamlining adverse event reporting, and minimizing regulation resulting in increased cost and complexity without compromising patient safety or privacy must also be accomplished. Finally, insurance reimbursement for clinical trial costs needs to be addressed nationally. In my home state of New Jersey, I was a member of the New Jersey Working Group to improve outcomes in cancer patients. Our group was successful in convincing the insurance companies covering New Jersey residents to voluntarily reimburse for approved clinical trial-related expenses. This could serve as a model for a national effort. Another important aspect to improve outcomes for people with cancer is to have more clinical trials available. This can be accomplished by increasing the efficiency of moving clinical trial concepts through the approval process before they come available to the public. 
The current system should be more efficient and held to more business-like timelines for results. Specifically, the cooperative groups in the National Cancer Institute reviews process takes too long, at times years, and should have efficiencies mandated by government since it is government that supports these efforts. Moreover, encouraging and rewarding the national cooperative groups to work together on questions that require a large number of patients to, answers, to, to answer is essential. Finally, the issues of creating an environment, intellectual property protection, FDA approval support, et cetera, for multiple agents to be tested together for effectiveness prior to the FDA approval process needs to be addressed. In summary, I believe this is an exciting time for those engaged in the battle against cancer. The fruits of our efforts over the past 35 years are just beginning to be realized. It is clearly no time to retreat or claim defeat, but instead refocus our energies to make the entire system more efficient, less expensive, and more user-friendly. Our family and friends afflicted with cancer deserve our collective best effort. In doing so, participation in clinical trials should increase, resulting in meaningful answers and better outcomes sooner for those battling this dread disease. Thank you. I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you very much. Dr. Comas. Congressman Davis, Waxman, and members of the committee, I want to thank you for this opportunity to testify. Have it, uh, is your button on? Try it. I want to thank you for this opportunity to testify on behalf of the 8,000 cooperative group members from cancer centers, community practices, and patient advocacy groups across the country. Most importantly, we should all thank the courageous patients who enter our clinical trials. They are the real pioneers who move the frontiers of cancer treatment forward. There are two distinct forces in cancer clinical trials. Those studies directly supported by industry and overseen by the FDA and those studies supported by the NCI, which are conceived, designed, and executed in academic and community practices throughout the nation. Pivotal industry-supported trials are directed towards drug approval. Cooperative group trials are designed to evaluate new approaches and establish new evidence-based standards of care. We estimate that approximately 50,000 patients participate in clinical trials yearly. The NCI-funded cooperative groups account for about half, or 25,000 of those patients. The cooperative groups have always played a key role in the nation's cancer research system. We develop curative therapies for childhood cancers, improve the post-surgical survival for patients with breast and colorectal cancer by 25 to 30 percent, and showed that cancer can indeed be prevented in high-risk patients. As importantly, though, the publicly funded system allows us to ask and answer questions that challenge the mainstream. Our studies evaluating high-dose chemotherapy for breast cancer showed that this extraordinarily expensive and toxic treatment was of no clear benefit, saving the country hundreds of millions of dollars and patients unquestionable toxicity. Much has changed since President Nixon declared the war on cancer. The understanding of the biology of cancer has increased tremendously. The public and private sector has invested huge resources in the development of biologically directed therapies, and new targeted agents are ending the oncology practice in our phase two and three trials. The cooperative groups have adjusted to the opportunities and challenges created by these changes. We are investigating the newest molecules and approaches. Virtually all of our studies now include laboratory correlative studies which attempt to define why something does or does not work. In order to do this, we've established excellent tissue banks and laboratory programs in cancer centers throughout the country which collect, store, and analyze tissue specimens and correlate biology with clinical events occurring in our controlled clinical trials. But we must do more to ensure that patients have the opportunity to benefit from our work. First, let me address the issue of accrual of adults on the cancer clinical trials. We estimate that only about 3 to 5 percent of adult cancer patients participate in clinical trials. This number was con confirmed prospectively in our Harris survey, which we did along with Ellen's group, which also revealed that only 15 percent of patients were aware that participation was even an option. That survey also reinforced the critical role of the oncologist in informing and educating patients about this option, increasing awareness, dispelling misconceptions, Engaging physicians are key elements of the solution to the accrual problem. These considerations led the Coalition of National Cancer Cooperative Groups to launch a national awareness campaign along with Newsweek, which is in its fourth year, develop web-based tools to facilitate trial searches, and work with the American Society of Clinical Oncology in developing both recognition and educational programs for physicians. Indeed, the efforts of the Coalition and others have borne some fruit. 
There has been a 30 percent increase in overall accrual onto cooperative group studies from 1997 to 2002, from about 20,000 patients a year to about 26,000 patients. But more needs to be done. However, the system is stressed even at this level of accrual. The cooperative groups have been and remain chronically underfunded. Two extensive reviews of the system in the mid-1990s recommended that the cooperative groups be funded at the full peer-recommended level. We continue to be funded at approximately 60 percent of that level, and funding has been flat for the last three years. This stifles innovation, destabilizes key functions such as our tissue banks, data management platforms, and acts as a disincentive to both academic and community physician participation. Keep in mind that about 60 percent of accrual comes from community-based practices. The NCI reimburses $2,000 per case to perform the research at the site. It is estimated in the ASCO survey that the actual cost is more like four to $6,000 per case. The ability for both academic and community sites to continue in government-sponsored work will be increasingly challenged, particularly when the full effect of the Medicare Modernization Act of 2003 takes place in 2005. The entire system is being buried under a regulatory mountain. It is estimated that about 30 percent of clinical trials research dollars goes towards ensuring regulatory compliance. Our studies are overseen by about 1,600 separate IRBs. HIPAA compliance complicates our laboratory work. The current discussions about off-label drug use in oncology could have a huge impact on our studies, which try to explore new indications and uses for targeted agents as they become available. We all believe that there is an important balance between the need for innovation and the critical societal concerns, but the balance must ultimately be struck for the advantage of all who suffer from cancer. The cooperative groups remain totally committed to providing high-quality care and new opportunities for cancer patients. But rest assured, the development of the newer cancer treatments will make clinical trials more complicated and more costly, and accrual will remain, remain a major concern. The cooperative group chairs have developed a white paper entitled Harnessing the Science, a proposal to improve the publicly funded cancer clinical research system, which I have submitted for the record which outlines our thoughts on what can be done to ensure the continued vitality and importance of the cooperative groups in the publicly funded system, which is so critical to our cancer patients in the nation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Stovall, thanks for being with us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Um, I am Ellen Stovall, President and CEO of the National Coalition for Cancer Survivorship, and I'm a 32-year, two-time survivor of cancer. NCCS is the nation's oldest survivor-led organization for people with all types of cancer. Our mission is to advocate for quality cancer care for all Americans, including the 10 million cancer survivors alive today in this country. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to testify and to the important work of this committee. I have a very direct and personal experience with cancer clinical trials. When I was first diagnosed in 1971, I actually started treatment on the day that President Nixon signed the National Cancer Act. My father literally thought I'd be cured in seven years, um, as the whole world would be of cancer. Unfortunately, um, I was unable to participate in a cancer clinical trial promising um, a new therapy for the type of Hodgkin's disease that I have because I was deemed ineligible for the trial as I had just had a baby. Um, today, that that therapy has become the standard of care for Hodgkin's disease, and when I was re-diagnosed with the same disease 12 years later, I was able to take the drugs that had been in that clinical trial some 12 years earlier. So I really do understand the progress that's made through clinical research. I cite this experience to draw your attention to two key issues. First, restrictive standards for trial enrollment unnecessarily prohibit many patients from entering a trial. And second, clinical trials do serve as the means of testing new therapies and moving the standard of care forward step by step, extending or even saving many lives that would have been lost to cancer. There are many reasons why the rate of participation in trials is low. Both physicians who enroll their patients in trials and those individuals who would agree to re receive their care in a trial encounter several barriers to participation. All of those obstacles must be addressed if we're to improve the clinical trial system. The community has made great strides in, a, in increasing the awareness that care in a clinical trial may indeed be the best treatment option for a cancer patient, but our educational mis mission is incomplete. 
We still have to address the fears of some regarding the risks associated with trials, as well as the reservation of others about the value of trials. This is perhaps most acutely felt in underserved communities where socioeconomic, cultural, ethnic, and language disparities present even more barriers. Cancer patients may have to make sacrifices to enroll in a trial, and they want to believe that their time and energy are well spent in a valuable research endeavor. Over the last several years, some researchers and companies have taken the step of involving advocates early in the clinical trial design process. The FDA has also made great progress, in, particularly in the last few years, of involving advocates at earlier and earlier stages of drug development. Those efforts have generally been rewarded because advocates have embraced those trials and encouraged participation in them. Examples of this are breast cancer advocates' involvement with the design of the Herceptin trials and multiple myeloma advocates' involvement more recently with trials for Velcade. For more than a decade, NCCS and a number of other patient advocacy organizations and professional societies like ASCO, societies like ASCO collaborated in a legislative effort to address the failure by third-party payers to pay for the routine patient care costs and trials. After many years of unsuccessful legislative effort, we were able to persuade the Clinton administration to issue an executive me memorandum instructing Medicare to allow all beneficiaries, those with cancer as well as other life-threatening diseases, to participate in high-quality cancer uh, clinical trials, such as those sponsored by federal programs or under the oversight of FDA. With this change in the leadership role of Medicare in health policy, reimbursement has seemingly become less of an obstacle. While cost is a primary concern, of no less concern is the fact that so few doctors recommend a clinical trial for their patients as a viable treatment option. Clinical research is expensive, requiring an extensive infrastructure both at the central point of control, that is the research centers providing overall management of the trial, and at the level of the individual provider. Research requires sophisticated, dedicated personnel, such as research nurses, as well as the means for data collection and management, not to mention additional time commitment from physicians involved. For many years, cancer clinical researchers have made clear that the rate of payment from NCI for their participation is inadequate, despite some modest increases over the last few years. Privately funded research has overtaken that sponsored by NIH and other federal sources because industry is willing and able to pay the full cost of research, whereas the government's funding lags behind. As you probably know, over the last two decades, cancer care has truly moved into the community. As much as 80% of cancer care is provided by community oncologists around the country. This system has been welcomed by cancer patients who prefer to receive their care near their homes, thereby avoiding the dislocation that occurs if they must travel. Obtaining care in the community does not eliminate a patient's ability to receive care in a trial. And as we just heard from Dr. Comas, as many as 60% of clinical trial enrollees are referred to trials by community doctors. The fact remains that only a small percentage, percentage of adults are enrolled. We're hearing disturbing reports from community oncologists that as a result of changes in Medicare reimbursement for cancer care that were included in the MMA, they may be forced to reassess their participation in clinical trials altogether. The MMA reformed the system of payment that was overpaying for chemotherapy drugs, a reform that we all agree was necessary. The bill also made a temporary adjustment in the payment for expenses associated with delivering chemotherapy. But the concern of all of us who care about quality cancer care is that in 2005, this new law will reduce total payments for cancer care to such an extent that services offered by the community oncologist will have to be reduced and clinical pr trial participation may be among the first things to go. We often describe the system of cancer care in the United States as the best in the world, and yet a series of reports from the Institute of Medicine's National Cancer Policy Board proclaim great inconsistencies in the quality of care and the lack of any systematized way of assuring access to it. We do know that a good deal of this disparity could be corrected if more people were involved in clinical research and were assured access to a high-quality clinical trial as a matter of first course rather than last resort. Our country is unusual in our ability to provide high-quality care, including care in a trial in a community. But the system is suffering from so many strains that I fear all these factors will create such a stress that it may be impossible to clinic, carry on clinical research in the future that people could have access for. NCCS and others have been engaged for more than a decade in efforts that will ensure the clinical trials are an integral part of cancer care in this country. We are dedicated to that outcome, and we will look forward to cooperating with this committee and others in assuring that it continues in the future. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much. Um, I think the committee has some questions, so I'll start with Judge Carter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank all of you 
for being here. Uh, Mr. Stovall, please don't be mad at me for what I said about uh, the uh, Lance Armstrong, but it was a shock to me to, to realize that the definition of a survivor was survive each time. And as you pointed out in your testimony, you said, I'm a two-time survivor. To me, a survivor is it's all over and it didn't ha won't happen again. It would be nice if that were true. Yeah, and that's what we're, and I think that's the goal we're looking for. Uh, and, a, and a question I also have in, in questioning what, what's going on, and, and maybe you can give me an answer. Uh, it seems to me that the research that we're doing uh, in the areas of cancer is how to fight the tumor. Uh, are, you know, are we doing, do you, do you know in these research, in these clinical research uh, experiments that are being done, are we doing anything to inoculate for cancer, to come up with a genetic engineering for can uh, to fight cancer? Uh, is the, are we are we still in the same direction we were in 1970? Let how to fight a tumor. Does anybody know the answer to that? I'm happy to comment on that. I, I think I think it's twofold. I think one, in sort of a generic way of speaking, is there is a focus to make the tumor go away, and that's a lot of giving medicines, doing surgery, radiation. But I think there's a growing and equal emphasis of keeping it from coming back and understanding how and what you need to do. And you're right. I mean, there are strategies now aimed at using certain approaches to make tumors go away and then using cancer vaccines as an example to prevent it from coming back. Um, when you have therapies that are only of modest benefit, uh, you do the best you can. There are a whole new class of agents now, uh, you heard about them this morning, that, that's changing the whole cancer paradigm that I'm not even sure how to answer that question. Because it may be, you don't, want to, you don't need to make the tumor go away and the person could have a happy and healthy life, like Levac that you heard about. It doesn't cure CML, but it makes that clone of cell go away for a very long period of time, maybe forever. So the answer to that question is changing. But I do think your concern about keeping it from coming back is on the minds of people who do this sort of thing. You know, one of the things, just human, human nature, and I, I, I have no expertise in this at all, uh, just human nature and comments. Uh, in Texas, uh, MD Anderson has a, a great reputation in Texas. Uh, anybody that's got cancer in Texas will try to go to MD Anderson Hospital. Uh, I'm sure there are people at Breckenridge Hospital in Austin, oncologists that can do a great job in treating, uh, and it, that's the publicly perceived, as perceived, although it's really a private hospital now, it's perceived by the people in Austin to be a public hospital. Okay, because it was at one time our public hospital. If given the choice, they will go to the to the to the MD Anderson, which is funded heavily by public funds, but it's perceived to be a great scientific research center, a private hospital, if you will. It's perceived that way, and everybody would want to go to MD Anderson because they think they have success, and I think that's part of what your clinical trial situation is. People perceive this as another government program, rather than if you do you get my drift. Mm -hmm. And when you're talking about the National Cancer Institute, well, they've been at it for, for 50 years, uh, with 52 billion dollars worth of uh, of money spent. They're just another government program. And if I can go to MD Anderson and participate, that's fine. And in fact, I think MD Anderson actually runs some of your programs. But do you understand? It's the public perception, and I would be willing to bet. You have a better uh, turnout at MD Anderson in Texas than you would someplace else. I'd be willing to bet the farm on that. Uh, so it, a whole lot of what you have is the public perception that government is failing in the war on cancer and that it's going to take private in involvement to succeed in the war on cancer. Well, I, I did make a statement that I will stand on. I think that the government side of the equation can be more efficient. And I think that it takes too long to get things through the process. And I think we have created a bureaucracy that you heard about that's impeding uh, discovery and making it harder to do. And you know, I, I'm, I've learned more in the last two years as a cancer administrator than I ever learned as a cancer investigator about why we're not getting more people onto clinical trials. And many of them are business issues. They're not science issues. And these are the things that, that one of the reasons I wanted to come here today was to address this with, with Congress, because you fund these, these efforts. So I think if you, the, money, the money for us, for you, is to look at these things and to try to drive efficiencies into the system. Absolutely, and that, that's one of the reasons I, I mentioned to the last panel 
about the intellectual properties issues. Uh, the incentives to, and, and let's face it, we live in a world where we're all trying to make a living, and the incentives to go out and ch meet these challenges and invest private capital in meeting these challenges, need, in my opinion, need to be encouraged. The government can't fight this war forever. We fought it, and we're, we're, we can use some help. I guess is what I'm saying. There's one other thing I want to say before I don't want to monopolize the microphone, but the, the, another misnomer, this concept of clinical research, people hear research and it has all these connotations that we heard one of the congressmen speak to before. In, in cancer care, when the outcome is dismal, clinical trials should be the standard of care, not that there's something better and they're trying this out. I mean, that's a bad way of looking at it, particularly when the likelihood as we get smarter about the mechanisms of the disease, the how to read if something's effective or not, are improving at light speed, the likelihood of you having a better outcome by participating in trial is going to go up proportionately. So what we need to do as a nation is to push cancer trials out into the community offices, into the hospitals that aren't the MD Andy Andersons of the world, because that's not where all patients are treated. That's where the minority of patients are treated. That's right. We have to get this in the doctor's offices. And in order to do that, we're going to have to support them. We're going to have to provide them funding for research nurses, data managers, and we're going to have to simplify the process or it's not going to happen. We're going to have to convince the public's perception that they'll get that equal treatment in that doctor's office that they would get in this famous supposedly famous cancer uh, center. And that's, uh, that's the perception you've got to overcome on these clinical trials, in my opinion. Uh, my time's up. Thank okay. you, no, Thank you very much. Mr. Garrett, would you like to ask any questions? Thank you, and I appreciate the testimony of everyone. Um, a couple of quick questions. First of all, with respect to New Jersey and on the insurance side of the issue, you indicated uh, how you were able to con convince the insurance industry to pro provide coverage for the expenses of um, clinical trials. A, how did you do that? B, what is the status nationally, if you know? And C, what is the uh, recommendation as far as facilitating that on a national basis? Well, how, how we did in this state is we got the major uh, cancer program directors and people involved in various aspects of clinical trials to come together in a forum, and we brought in the CEOs and other representatives of the insurance industry and, and showed them the data. We, 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 made the, we made the claim, look, you know, you're paying for things that are marginally effective. Wouldn't you want to pay for something that could be better for your subscriber? And they got it. And they got it to the point where they did it voluntarily. I can't speak to the rest of the nation. I know there's efforts around the country, but I'm not, I'm not privy to that information. You know, maybe I can help clarify. This is a very complicated issue. In the Harris survey that I mentioned before, we asked several questions about uh, personal barriers to participation, travel, taking time off from work, insurance coverage, et cetera. And the thing that was on the very top of the list, 60 percent of the 6,000 cancer patients that we uh, surveyed said that they were afraid their insurance companies wouldn't pay. Then we went to the 4 percent of patients who did actually participate and asked the final question, which was, in the end, did your insurance company pay? And 86 percent said yes. Now, how hard it was to get there, we didn't ask, or how difficult it was to navigate the system. But this insurance barrier issue is a major perception barrier, at least. And there are now, I, Ellen may know the exact number, I think there are 19 states now that have legislative solutions. There are about three states that have non-legislative solutions. Medicare say they would pay. And I think it's incumbent on us, and this is what we try to do in a lot of our our materials is to get the word out that, in fact, your insurance companies have said that they would pay, that states are backing you, and if you're having trouble, you know, you have to find, uh, you know, use that information to make sure that you have access to clinical trials. And, and following up on this, then, if I may, the, Dr. Cummins, you made the comment, and, and you did too, as far as the responsibility of greater education, but to me, is it, isn't the education responsibility on the part of the doctor, the oncologist, isn't he supposed to know this, and isn't he the one that's supposed to, A, convince the patient that uh, clinical trials are necessary, and B, if he's been in the business for, or the uh, practice for a while, that he should know that uh, the statistics that you rattle off, that he can put right. his patient at ease? Right. Well, Mr. Carter, I think, hit the nail on the head. You can, it's very hard to battle public perception. I'm a practicing physician. I see cancer patients. I still put people on clinical trials. I do it every day. And it's hard. And the reason it's hard is because people come in with preconceived notions. And the minute you start talking about a clinical trial, all of a sudden warning bells go off. You know, we have high profile cases in our country. The Jesse Geisinger case, uh, going back historically to the Tuskegee experiment, the whole concept of what IRBs are doing now. It's, I think, 
pushing people in the general direction of being suspicious and having a bias against clinical trial. And I don't think at the individual physician level that that's going to be reversed very readily. I think it has to be a societal issue. Maybe I can follow up on that because we've studied this a lot. I, I agree totally. In the end, it's the interaction between the doctor and the patient that decides when somebody goes on. And in fact, I mentioned in my remarks that uh, only 15 percent of the patients in the survey were aware that they could participate. 85 percent weren't. If you look at the people who were aware, a quarter went on. And if you look at the difference between the quarter that went on study and the three quarters that didn't, it was all the doctor. The doctor uh, helped educate them about trials, helped find the trial form. The doctor and the staff worked on this together. And I, I agree, uh, th there are two components of how we have to approach this. One is to increase awareness and, and decrease misconceptions on the part of the patients and the public. But the, the other thing is to facilitate the involvement of the doctor in the process. Uh, and, you know, uh, reimburse, it's not just reimbursement. It's, it takes time, it takes staff time, patient time uh, uh, to, to do this. And we have to get the resources out to the sites, particularly the community sites that are really committed to do this. And the resources are not there and the challenges are great. And, and, and I just want to add that, um, you know, I, I put a lot in my testimony, um, my submitted testimony about physician reimbursement issues with which, Mr. Chairman, you touched on. And it's, it's not about the income of doctors or what doctors make. It's about how we value the time they spend with their patients and their families. And when we've been overpaying for the chemotherapy that they provide and grossly underpaying for the time that they spend counseling families and patients about treatment decisions, which are more and more complex as time goes on with the new science, um, I think that we really have to relook at our reimbursement system and put the dollars where we value the doctor's time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Duncan, you have any questions? Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for calling this hearing. I, one thing I'm curious about, uh, I have read in the, um, in the Wall Street Journal and other places sometimes that it, that, um, that it takes, I've seen figures of 650 to 850 million to get uh, a, a typical drug approved in this country and sometimes takes 10 or 12 years. And I've also read that uh, in no other developed nation does it take anywhere close to as long. And I remember, I remember the Wall Street Journal had on its front page several years ago, this small company in Illinois had a breast cancer detection pad that had been approved every place, every other country where they had asked for approval, most of them uh, within days or weeks. But they had been, I think it was nine years, and they still weren't approved in this country. And they had some uh, quotes from cancer specialists saying that uh, thousands of lives had been lost because that had happened. And I'm just wondering, I assume that none of you can say anything critical about the FDA uh, uh, or maybe they'd get back at you later, but are we doing any better on any of that stuff or why is it that it takes so much longer and so much more money to get approved here as compared to any other developed nation? Uh, I mean, you can go overboard on anything, and, I, and I'm just wondering about all that. Does it, do, can any of you say anything no, on that? I, I mean, I'd like to comment Without on that. getting in trouble? Well, you always get in trouble. Okay. So. Okay. I mean, but um, I, I do think that the FDA talked a little bit about this uh, critical path document that they put out. And, I, and personally, as someone involved both on the academic side and on the corporate side, I find them uh, getting more and more user friendly. And I do think that some of the initiatives will decrease time to discovery and cost of discovery, particularly as we get better at screening uh, for toxicities and putting the right kind of people on trials, i.e. people have the potential for benefit. But I, I see the, the major stumbling block, the rate limiting step, becoming this issue about clinical trials. This is not going to go away. This is going to get worse. Um, people in, in the community, people who are doing this, you're not going to answer a question of whether or not something is safe or effective until you test it in a person, period. And until we fix this system, which is going in the wrong direction, that's going to maintain that high cost of discovery, the 10 to 12 year timeline. And you heard plenty of testimony today to attest to that. And I think that's where the emphasis should be now. 
I, I just want to um, add on to that. I mean, I, I remember Dr. Pazder, who was in your first panel, uh, remarking at several meetings over the last few years that we've attended that um, when a really good drug, a really novel therapy comes to the FDA, you see it move very, very fast. Um, I don't know what that means if, if they're not exciting therapies that are coming to the FDA, what the counter uh, veiling point would be. But I do know that the FDA, um, uh, the burden on the FDA in terms of um, uh, peer review capabilities, um, well-trained specialists to review oncology products, uh, is just not what it needs to be uh, in terms of uh, capacity building. Um, and I think that's another area for this committee perhaps to examine in its future deliberations. I think that would be a very interesting thing to pursue. Well, what happens when, when if, if it takes, uh, you know, hundreds of millions or years to get a drug approved, then obviously what you do, this is, this is one of the main reasons why the drug industry has ended up in the hands of a few big giants, because a small company can't uh, ha handle that. And then also the small companies don't have the connections within the FDA. I've, uh, Chairman Burton said in here one time uh, that uh, nine out of the last 14 FDA commissioners work for the big drug companies now. I don't know if that's true or not, but it, but boy, there's a it, there just is a a lot of uh, a lot of things uh, going on apparently that uh, uh, I mean people people wonder why drugs cost so much. And that's, uh, th this seems to me to be why. We, the, it's our own, it, we've let the government get too big and too bureaucratic. And if we don't cut this down a little bit and speed this process up and make it where a small company has a chance uh, again, these drug prices are just going to go, go up even more, it seems to me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Let me just try to wrap a few questions up. Um, First of all, let me just pick up on where Mr. Duncan uh, left off. There's one or two things government could do uh, to really help this process along. Would it be the funding dollars? Would it be speeding up the regulatory process? Would it be reducing the, the paperwork and the bureaucracy that uh, you, you have to go through and patients have to go through? Uh, would it be information dissemination? I mean, what, what, let, let me start, Ms. Doval. You, you're, you, you've taking a leadership role in this from a patient's perspective. What do you, from your perspective, what do you see? And then let me ask everybody what they see from their perspective. I'm talking about government's role now, because so much of this is private. Uh. Well, I think as, as, as patient advocates, we do look to government and the very, very important role both the FDA and the NIH and CMS, frankly, pay in this whole, um, you know, landscape of, of both developing new drugs, um, the research and approval, and then finally paying for them and getting them to people. Um, I would like to see better coordination um, among these agencies, uh, working more collaboratively, um, having some of the um, regulatory barriers removed, um, having a bit of a more transparency to the FDA processes that I believe could, um, could truly um, make things work better, better training of reviewers, um, more attention paid to that, pro that whole process, including um, I think something that has been mentioned but largely um, not examined very closely, and that is uh, institutional review board reforms. Um, because I think the regulatory burdens on the system, as Dr. Comas and others have mentioned, are, are at this point very onerous and, and really helping lawyers more than they're helping patients um, succeed in, in getting getting yeah, these new therapies. I, I like to that. And that's not even, I mean, that's something that, A, is within this committee's jurisdiction, but secondly, is not even big dollars. It's just trying to be efficient. It's just, we do. It's just making more efficient the, the things yeah. that we already have in place, because I do think that the protections that government offers are very important to patient care, but shouldn't be burdensome. Thank you. Dr. Cummins, do you have any thoughts yeah, on that? I, I would follow up with three areas. One is I think the government, the NCI has to recognize that it needs to fund these things at an acceptable level, at a level that it can be done. For the group system, $150 million out of a 4.3 or $4.4 billion budget, I mean, that's like chump change. So I mean, people have to decide whether they want the government to be involved in this, and they have to be, because we can ask questions that a company can't. The second thing is we have to be able to interact and, and develop relationships between the public side and the private side. The private side has developed all the drugs. And we have to be able to work with them very, very effectively. And there are a lot of barriers to that that need to be broken down. 
And uh, as well, I think that the layering of the government bureaucracies have to be harmonized between FDA, NCI, et cetera. And lastly, I follow up one other huge thing that could happen, and it does relate to the office, o OHRP, the regulatory office. If that office said, wrote a letter to the 1,600 IRBs that we deal with tomorrow and said, we will accept the uh, recommendation of the central IRB that's been sponsored by the NCI, that would open up the whole deal. Uh, those three things could really make a huge difference. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. McCor, any thoughts? Yeah, just uh, it's somewhat repetitious, but it's for, for the government which funds all of these efforts to take a product development, like you want to make a product mindset and look at all of the issues that we've discussed and see where government can intervene in a way that continues to protect patient safety, continues to protect patient privacy, but gets rid of the bureaucracy and the inefficiencies. Centralizing IRBs, getting rid of uh, the craziness we have with the way we do adverse event reporting. And there's a list of things that I don't want to repeat in the interest of time that, that can and should be done. Well, it, it, let me ask you this. Do you think that the central IRB that's been developed by the National Cancer Institute has proven to be uh, effective in eliminating duplicative applica uh, applications in the review process? I think it will. I think it, it has been and I think it will. And I think okay. centralization of IRBs uh, in the country would be wonderful. Uh, um, let me, well, I'll give you a second. Let me just ask this too, from, uh, in terms of getting the doctors involved in this, because that's really the, the, uh, your, your pressure point here. People get diagnosed by their doctors, what are my options? What's the best way to get that? Continuing medical education, an option here for uh, oncology. You, you do an hour talking about what is involved here, what are the options, how they can counsel patients, or, or is there a better way to get that word out? Because it seems to me if we do a better job of that, uh, we're going to have uh, plenty of people you know, uh, lining up to be part of these trials. It will only happen if you match that with the resources they need to do it, and they don't have it right now. Okay. But, but I also think that, uh, you know, I mentioned in the body of my talk that the coalition, you know, of the cooperative, cancer cooperative groups are working closely with ASCO, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, in education. You know, I think that we have to, you know, ASCO is perfectly positioned to try to take the lead in this educational process along with us. And, in fact, there have been some innovative approaches with regards to recognition awards at the annual meeting and also with, uh, uh, we're developing a, a series of, of meetings to try to have the 25 or 30 percent of the practices that are really great at this educate the people who are really interested but can't see a way how to do it. And over the course of the next three years, we hope to have several meetings and a syllabus that arises from that. I think we have to focus on the doctors who are interested in doing this but don't seem to have the wherewithal to do it. But it can't be done without resources. Mr. Well, let me ask you, you can answer that, but also as you look around and, and you network out with patients and so on, are we seeing any geographical issues on this as well or any demographic issues in terms of who's getting notified, who sees the options and who's lining up? Well, I, to answer your last question first, I, I really think that um, if you looked at the map that um, Michelle Christian put up originally with all the dots on it about where where places are funded to do the work, there's a lot. There's a big gap right in the middle of the country where there aren't too many dots, and this represents a lot of farmland. It represents a lot of rural America and a lot of poor people. Um, and I w and I want to add on to that that um, that the disparity again um, is 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 created both in the inconsistency in the way treatment is provided and offered to patients, but also the health care disparities. The uninsured, underinsured are are terribly disadvantaged by not having access. I really think that the, the, the point, again, building on what Bob just said about physicians, um, physician education, training, all of that is wonderful. If we do not fix the reimbursement system that's being dismantled with the current MMA, um, we really are going to see a tr even more disparity in care than we're seeing now. And, and that's not just with uh, clinical research, that's with all kinds of treatment. Because doctors are just going to go out of business, and it's just a, a pure and simple fact. Uh, and that's a problem it's across It's a serious medical. problem. It's not just here, it's everywhere. In terms Every, of the, right. You get the government buying so much health care, um, and that's how we think we save money. Uh, let me ask you this, too. Has the FDA's accelerated approval, their expanded access, priority reviews, and fast-track policies, do you think they've improved and shortened the length of the approval process as a whole? And do patients receive drugs and therapies more quickly under these policies, or do you think it's just a, a lot of rhetoric? 
I have seen Im improvement, um, and uh, I think it's because I know that patient advocates are actually in there, and they're involved, and they're, they're constantly putting pressure as well. Uh, they have the most to gain or lose from, from what happens with new therapies that come through the FDA. So I would say, yes, there has been improvement, and I think particularly under Dr. McClellan when he was there and Dr. Pastor specifically, um, we saw tremendous improvement. No, I, I agree with that, and I think that the, uh, that the drugs that appear active are getting in the hands of the physicians uh, and patients quicker. And I think that most as importantly, you know, we're regulated by two bureaucracies, the NCI bureaucracy and the FDA bureaucracy, and we need to, to, to harmonize those things. And in fact, uh, uh, Rick Pazder and Michelle and, and those of us from the ex extramural environment are working on trying to do those things. So. It'll be very, very important to facilitate this interaction between the public side and the private side of the system. Well, let me say to all of you, thank you for, for first of all your testimony. I think it's been very, very helpful to us. I hope it's been, uh, you know, helpful to the previous panel as well as they, you know, take notes on this and try to improve and see what we can do about it. But also, thank you for what you're doing in the fight against cancer. You're on the front lines. All of you have a little bit different roles, but it, what you're doing is very, very important. And I want to thank you uh, for that. Um, and I will now adjourn the hearing. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. It's been 50 years since the nation's highest court desegregated schools with its ruling on Brown versus Board of Education. Tavis Smiley hosts a day-long look back tomorrow. Our live coverage starts at 8 a.m. Eastern, and it continues in the afternoon at 1.30. Guests include Reverend Jesse Jackson, Lonnie Guineer, and members